Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Paul Waper. Paul Waper is an experienced computer professional who works for Red Hat and has got a project called Insights, which will help systems administrators. Please welcome Paul. Cool. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, I've been working on this uh, in the Insights team for about 18 months. Uh, it's been a lot of fun so far. The team itself has been going for about three or four years, the project. Um, so, and the main aim for, the main sort of target org audience for uh, Insights is sysadmins. So who are the sysadmins in the audience? Good, we've got a fair number of you. Now, I, I worked for two years in support in Red Hat. Um, I have worked for probably 20 years doing support. And we all know, as sysadmins, there's, there's too much to do. You're, every day you're expected to do more on more machines, with more services, with less time, with less training. And then someone comes along and says, hey, we've got this new thing called containers. Aren't they, aren't they great? You can deploy them, right? And then, <clears throat> so we end up looking at problems and not even being sure what, what the errors are telling, telling us. Um, you may have never seen this before. It may be something that you saw six months ago, but you can't remember what that means anymore. Um, and it means, ultimately, that we end up being too reactive. We're running around with a fire hose trying to put out little bits of fire. And just before we get, actually get to that one, we have to run off to this one and put it up at another fire. And we ever, never actually stop and make sure that not only does the fire, is the fire out, but it never starts again, that we can, all wait, we can keep it out, we can solve that problem permanently. And we end up staring at messages like this, which if you're anything like me, once you've spent some time considering this, you say, well, do I add one to checkpoint segments? Do I, do I double it? Do I square it? Who knows? And there's a good reason for Postgres not telling you this. It's involved in trying to get that, the checkpoints done as quickly as it can, and it's not keeping track of the, the timing information. But you can work out from that timing information, from the logs, what you should set that to. It's you know, just a bit of mathematics and looking at config files. So how do we deal with problems as a sysadmin? How do you actually go about solving things? Well, you probably read a bunch of text files, look in configuration, look in logs, run a bunch of commands to see uh, further output. You then sort of draw from that raw text a bunch of ideas, information about what the actual problem might be. You check that against your knowledge of how so software works, what no common errors that you know about, what uh, failure modes you've seen, and then usually you come up with some kind of idea about not only what the problem is, but how to solve it. Surprisingly enough, this is exactly how Insights works. It reads a bunch of text files and command, command lines. It processes those into structures in Python, which make the data easier to use. Those, that information is used in rules, which are written in Python, short functions, and the rules provide not only information about what the problem is, but hopefully how to solve it. So my main objective today is to teach you how to write rules. That's the thing that I'd love for everyone to get start doing. Let's take a really simple example. Um, you come in one morning and half your services aren't working and no one can ping localhost. And you find out that someone's been clever. They've written a script to add things to the etc. host file automatically, and they've overwritten it rather than appending to it. And I know this is unlikely, right? But <laughs> as a simple example, <laughs> as a simple yeah yeah as a simple example, let's let's follow this through. So how would we solve this in Insights? So the code looks basically like this. We've got a bit of preamble. But basically, there's a rule decorator 
on a function, and the, the decorator says, I'm going to need the host's file. And then the code basically says this, if localhost is not in the list of host names that I found, return a response to insights to, t to say that this particular condition occurred. We, the first argument is the error key, and that is just basically a simple text string that identifies this particular result of the rule. Each rule module can have multiple rules, each rule function can produce multiple outputs. It, so, for example, with Heartbleed, if you're running an outdated version of OpenSSL, that's one problem. If you're running an outdated version of OpenSSL and you've got programs actively using it, then that's another problem. If those problem, programs are then lis listening on open ports open to the internet, you've got a much higher problem and you can re return make response with different error keys depending on that. So what you're aiming for is that error key to sort of track that particular result of your processing. And then you basically bunch, have a bunch of key value pairs that give information. We can produce a nice error, you know, message to, to someone to say, you need to put local hosts back, but we can also give the list of hosts that were defined just in case someone was curious. The second example, um, if you happen to have two uh, NTP servers, and one of them goes down and the other happens to be more than about a thousand seconds out, Crony or NTPD will refuse to change this system clock by more than a thousand seconds, so you'll get a message like this. And no one rings up about this error. What they ring up about is Kerberos isn't authenticating anymore. And then you have to work out what of a bunch of different you know, problems has happened. This is a simple thing that you might recognize and say, hey, if you, re if you see this message, you're probably going to have a bunch of problems with files being out of date or um, things not authenticating. You might like to deal with it. And a rule for that might look something like this. It basically checks if there are any lines in our messages log that contain the seconds cannot adjust. And then if it found any lines, then it just returns a make response. As a, this is a, a simple rule. It's not, I'm not aiming for sophistication here. Now, the thing I want to highlight here is if you're, uh, reading, if, you're, if you're reading Valog messages, OK, that's good. Maybe it's fairly big, uh, half a gigabyte, say. That's OK, you can do that. If you have 100 processors reading Valog messages all looking for different strings, all at the same time, then that tends to bog things down. So what we did in Insights is make a system where it can scan the file once for all the tokens we look for, and then afterwards you can pull those out. So for example, here we say we use token scan, we give it an attribute name, adjust problems, we give it the string we want to look for, and then we say, the, we look for that attribute in the log object that we get out. And that's done all of that processing work, that, so, that search beforehand in one go, rather than us having to write our own loop for it. That's a not particularly interesting make response. We'd like to return some actual log lines so people can check what they were. And so instead we use keep scan, same arguments, but now the thing return the, the the attribute now contains the list of all the lines we we lo uh, we logged for that. And those two are two of the sort of standard patterns for reading log files, and all of the uh, log file parsers that we use, which are based on a, a common class, all implement that this um, functionality. So it's really easy to reason about what you get out. Just as a last example, um, this is another one that comes from our demo rule set. Um, our syslog can be configured to drop messages from processes if they're 
producing too many messages in a certain time. Um, we've, and we've kind of got two, fa two parts here. One is that this error message turned up in the log file. And the other is that our syslog is configured and it has a particular configuration setting. Insights gives you the ability to break down your rules into multiple parts and then let Insights dependency system work out which of those it needs to do. So we can mark a, a function as a condition, still give it the same rsyslogconf parser, um, and then that function name gets used as a dependency in the rule declaration. So if the etc. rsyslog.conf file is not found on this system, then the condition is never called and the rule never gets triggered because you didn't have the, these basic parts necessary for that. And again, that saves you a bunch of work trying to work out which of these things I need to check for. Then um, we also provide the feature um, for those people who, the, who've read the rsyslogconf and remain sane, you'll know that uh, trying to get work out what configuration parameters in there a little, is sometimes a little tricky. So we provide a helper function, config val. You give it a, a config name and a default. It gives you whichever of those it needs to actually return. Um, we also here want to do one more tricky thing. Um, there's kind of two, there's two conditions here, but there's also two states that we might be in. One is that uh, a process is re logging too much stuff and we want to know which process that is so that we can shut it up. Maybe the debug is too high or something like that or someone's trying to do something silly. We need to know what process that is. Likewise, maybe our syslog is just configured with too small a limit and we actually do want to hear about all of the, the log lines that are coming through. So firstly, we can use the uh, a sort of more generic scan process. Same idea, you use the dropped messages here as the attribute name, um, but then we can give it a function to we give a function to scan the scan object, uh, sorry, scan class method. Uh, we give a function to the scan class method, and that runs that function across the log, grabbing everything. And that again is done at the same time as everything's being read, so you're not rereading the file once it's out of cache and things like that. So what are these things that I keep on talking about in condition? and rule, um, I mentioned their name is parsers, and they're the sort of building block that you build rules out of. Uh, the main documentation is up on the web, uh, and the parsers index is there. You'll find it on the left-hand side in the contents. Um, the, there's over 300 parsers, so I'm not going to list them by name, um, but the key ones are all there, lots of log files, lots of standard commands that you'd use for debugging things, um, even directory listings so you can check for the existence of common files in common places. The, the key thing here that makes your life easy as a rule writer is that we've already done half of the, the process of encapsulating what you need and getting it into an easy format for you rather than writing your own tool to do so. So you want to write a rule, good. I want to teach you how to write a good rule. Firstly, return useful information. We can, for example, with the rsyslogconf uh, dropping messages, we can not only tell the user that these are the processes that are dropping messages and these are how many times, and this is a maximum burst rate and things like that that they reported, and maybe their process name so that it's easy to track down so that you don't have to know what it was doing four days ago. Um, but we can also 
tell them what the current configuration is, what the new configuration should be, and even what the log line should, so the config line should be in that file that helps them actually fix that problem. Likewise, you don't have to report anything if nothing is actually wrong. The whole job of a rule is to basically filter out things that it can ignore until it's just got a situation that you can, that you can report on. So if there are no actual drops, drop messages in the log file, then we don't return anything. Or we just return a none and that gets tidied up and no, no message is produced. Likewise, if the burst rate is less than the current limit, or is no greater than the current limit, then there's no point suggesting to increase it and therefore don't return anything. Likewise, um, there's a lot of ways in insights to minimise the effort that you go to um, in processing things. Instead of writing something to read a log file again, we have standard tools to do that. Instead of writing something to read a config file, we've already got a standard tool to do that. This is also a chance to, if you find something that we don't have, then that's also useful. This is a common body of things that everyone can share. And the last thing that I feel is important for me is, is to be proactive. Um, the good example that we have in the demo rule set is um, something to detect if smart control is reporting any re reallocated sect sectors on any disk. That, if you start seeing reallocated sectors, the disk is on its way out. It's not dead yet, but that's the right time to tell people to start thinking about buying a new disk, not when you're getting I.O. errors from it or when it's just died. You've got, we've got, actually got that chance to look at that information and say, now is when I need to deal with this. That's the kind of proactive message that we should be looking at rather than just detecting something by having it explode in our faces. So as a programmer as well, I like test-driven development and Insights is no exception. We have testing. It's also really inconvenient to leave machines around without local host in their host file. So what we do instead is we have a test framework. Um, we tell the test framework that we're going to be testing that, this particular rule. We then construct these collections of input data. This is a, from, for a test that pass, passes. We give it a name. We give it a series of um, fi virtual files as Python multi-line strings. And then we yield to the um, integration testing that this data, when fed into this rule, should produce a blank result. And likewise, with the, a test that should fail, we use the make response call again to, and we pass the, we use the error key, we fill in the actual values that we expect it to get from those particular inputs. So you're, you as a human can check that it's going to produce the right thing. And then we say, here's the data. That data fed into this rule will yield this result that we expect. So hopefully I've encouraged you to think about looking at insights here. Here's the main core that we've written. It's, that's the framework for processing all of that. It's also all of the parses, a bunch of other stuff. There's good documentation and good tutorials there. It's a little finicky to install, so I wrote a small install script, which you can get from my GitHub page. Um, you basically grab that, run install with an insights directory. It goes away and installs a bunch of things in a virtual environment, gives you a lot more messages than that, and then you seed into that directory activate the virtual environment, and then you're ready to go. The tool we have for, um, 
for looking at the results of rule processing at the moment is, is not, I hate to say this, but it's not beautiful. Um, what it does is basically produce a bunch of JSON files. And the idea here is that you are then going to be able to import or read those in your own programs um, and decide on things for there, from there. So you can run it with collect.py. Uh, you give it a plugin, a uh, collection of plugins with dash p. So we've given it the demo plugin collection. And on this machine where I played around with local hosts, it then gives me uh, in output slash rule, it gives me the, the, a file for, with JSON. That includes not only, as we'd kind of expect, the error key, um, but also the messages and the hosts defined as a, a list which I've alighted there. Um, so that, it, that's kind of a simple example of seeing the Python produce something that you can actually then read uh, either with a Java, sorry, a JSON pretty printer or uh, with some other program. The plugins demo, uh, or the demo plugins repository is at this URL. That's compressed, I know, and it's a bit hard to read, so I made a short URL for it. Um, the demo rule set is there for basically three reasons. One is so that you can install insights, install the demo rule set, try it out, and actually see if, you, if it works. So you know that insights is working. The second is as a kind of basic tutorial for how to write rules. There's a bunch of rules that are already working, showing the kinds of things that you can do with rules. Um, nothing is particularly sophisticated there, but hopefully it gives you a little uh, sort of extra uh, bunch of ideas as to how to com combine things. And the third is as a template for making your own repository for rules. So you can basically just remove the, the demo, um, but you'll see which files you need, which, what structure they need to be in, how to make the tests and so forth, so you can make your own rules. And this is the really big message that I want, to, want you to take away, um, that I'd really love to see people writing rule collections for programs they maintain, rule collections for places that they work in, um, rule collections for communities that they're in, and publish those online and get people to share them and work with them and improvement, improve them. Because I think there's a really important point that we miss as part of um, doing, uh, doing our job, both as, as sysadmins and as open source people. We're really good at improving the software. I, I talked to a friend of mine um, who works at Red Hat as well and said, oh, by the way, I've, I've written a rule to detect that particular, this particular thing that this, your program spits out. And he said, yeah, that's really great. In the new version, we've rewritten it so it adjusts the cache size automatically and you never have that problem ever again. And that's great. That's exactly how we should improve software. We should make it so that you don't have to read obscure log files and work out what's wrong and change the command line, sorry, change the configuration and restart everything every single time that something you know, needs to be re reconfigured. But we're really bad at improving the process of administrating systems. We've got a bunch of things um, to set things up and to automate running commands. But when it comes to debugging stuff, we keep on falling into this fundamental trap, which is assuming that it's only the human mind that can solve that problem. It's only me at this keyboard right now that can debug this. And that doesn't scale. Right? And it's, it's just frustrating because we end up um, solving the same problem over and over again. 
and you, see, you say, oh, yeah, I saw that six months ago. I thought they'd fixed it, but they didn't because someone came along, came along and forgot to update the master image on your virtual machines and it rolled out a whole bunch of machines that had openness, an old version of OpenSSL or something like that. So, if you, and yet, if you can, if you can teach someone else, if you can explain to someone else what that problem was and you can explain to them how you came to that conclusion, what things, what files you read, how you processed that information, you can probably write a script. You can probably write a program to detect that, right? And I know I've seen people doing this out there with, with small specific tools to look at specific things. And I know I've seen um, a bunch of basically um, commands in some of the larger um, infrastructure that will like check if everything's okay. I have yet to see any one of those tools actually tell someone how to fix it when it goes wrong. They just say, oh yeah, your, your node, you know, these, master, these um, replication nodes can't be found anymore. Okay. <laughs> can, can you give me a hint? Um, but more importantly than that, 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 that particular tool doesn't scale to anything else that you do. It's not available in any other program. It doesn't help your DNS server. It doesn't help your NTP servers. And what I'm hoping with Insights is that Insights provides that framework to make it easy to write rules and easy to make collections of rules that people can share. Because if we can share rules, we can keep on improving them. You can make them smarter. You can make them cope with more scenarios. And that's really what we want to be doing in, in problem solving. We don't want to solve the same problems over again. We want to move on. There's always going to be new, new problems to solve, right? There's, there's always going to be something that doesn't, that requires that bit more effort than having a piece of software work it out. But I'd rather automate the dull stuff than have to keep on redoing it. I seem to have steamed through my talk, so I'm about 15 minutes early. But thank you. Thanks very much. Are there any questions? Yes. Go mad. Uh, yeah, um, it seems that a lot of these e examples that you've given anyway are responding to particularly uh, specific situations where you, you, know, you know how to detect them and in a lot of cases you know what the solution is, like the, uh, the local host missing problem. Sure. Um, have you given any thought to, to ways to automatically repair these? So, you know, in that case you could just append to the file, fix it, and in a lot of these other cases maybe there's there are things that you could do to sort of sort of self-heal the system if you're that confident. In sure, sure. Um, I'm going to skirt dangerously along a, a line that I didn't want to cross, but on the other hand, there are plenty of automation <coughs> tools out there that will execute commands on remote machines. So if this can tell you that uh, localhost wasn't found on that machine, then there's probably a way of writing some automation tool to then automatically fix it. The interesting thing to me when I've talked about that idea with friends is the, the overwhelming reaction, at least from that group, was, whoa, whoa, we don't want some automation, automated system just running any old command on our machine, right? <laughs> so I think there's a... a 
a balance to be struck. You're absolutely right that the, the examples I've given there are fairly simple. Um, I'm picking things from the demo rule set so that you can actually go and have a look at them and um, so that they're, they're sort of easily available. I've talked with friends of mine in support um, who could, you know, where we could step into, um, you know, kernel backtraces and try to work out and, re and really recognise very specific errors that might have occurred, not just a sort of, you know, a, a simple thing going wrong. Or I guess the other example that I like to think of there is, um, a, you know, systems where the actual diagnosis might be very complicated. There might be a lot of things that you have to check and there might even be like uh, a friend of mine many years ago said, could you, could you detect if NFS has failed and tell us how to fix it? And that's like, well, there's only 40 books on that. Um, which one of the many, many different ways in which NFS failed do you want me to, do you want me to pinpoint? But, yeah, firstly, you can start spotting the obvious, the simple stuff. And secondly, yeah, there's, there might be stuff where, you know, you can write a tool to, to fix it based on the output of the, the, the rule code that picks up the information from JSON. And that would be like, you know, there's, there's no reason why you couldn't just include the command as a, as a key value and then something can, your, your automatic uh, tools can go, okay, well, I've got a command output here, I'll just run that. And that might, that might be exactly the way to solve that problem. Has that answered your question? Brilliant. Question over uh, there and there. Sorry, I'll save him a walk. No worries. Um, so I've kind of got a two-part question. The first is, what's the operating mode of this? Is it like an agent that runs on each box and talks yep. back to a central thing or that? And secondly, is it possible to get this to talk to some kind of centralized log aggregator, like maybe Splunk or something like that? Um, the first part, um, how, what's the, what's the uh, run mode? It's designed at least the the toolkit that we've got in um, in the open source core is basically the collect program which runs a once off collection. So you could then put that in a cron cron job, um, fire it off with some other process, um, do it once a day. It, it's kind of uh, at your liberty to then say how, how quickly you want to run that. Um, it would be, I think it's at this stage beyond the, at least the scope of insights to, to try to do more active monitoring and see what's changed. But that's be a really interesting approach to take. Feeding into central logs, um, the There's no, there's nothing particular in Insights. This and it, this is mainly um, the the core and the the rule sets, the collections that we're looking at, uh, is mainly designed to be run on one machine. Um, I, uh, I'm going to go and say it outright. I'm avoiding actually talking about what Red Hat does because I don't want to, this to be a product talk. I want this to be talk to the community and to talk about what you can do on your machine. Um, so there's no reason you couldn't do rsync or SSH to you know, copy those things up to a regular thing, date stamp them, um, track them, um, you know, work out how many issues you've got from how many files are in the rules directory, things like that. Um, and that would be a good layer on top of this. Um, you know, there's a community project. <laughs> Cool, thanks. Um, just carrying on with, with that integration with Logstash should be really interesting. Um, 
Is there a, and you may have touched on it, is there a, an education piece that's potentially part of it as well? You talked about time's drifting, it's drifting too far to be corrected. Is that an opportunity to actually point out not just you have this problem with NTP, but by the way, this may cause this. We've we've found that this causes the following problems. You know, you may yeah. remember maybe some from such earlier movies as The Failing of Kerberos, that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and again, this is the so. For example, you could put in your key value pairs a URL to your own internal wiki that said. Uh, our best practice on configuring servers, like let's say you detect that um, there are exa there's exactly one NTP server and you can point them to URLs that says this is not, not, you know, not in line with our policies, please use the following NTP servers uh, and collect like that. The, I'm, I, I'm hoping that my choice of um, my choice of examples hasn't sort of given a, ba a bad impression because obviously a lot of sites are then going to be are going to, going to be doing configura active configuration management. Uh, you want you know one NTP or one ChronyConf file distributed that's going to have all the right servers. But yeah, absolutely. There's no reason why you couldn't put more information in there or a, a link. Um, the I'd li I'd, one of my one of the projects that I mean to get around to is to write a, a nicer version of the collect process that can do the collection and then output rules and provide. You know, um, if you've included a URL make it a link or you know make it make a sort of provide a nice web web front end for that that can pull resources in and make things look good um, but again that's the, that's a I'd love to see that kind of thing as a as a project to um, to make it, to let people use it better question How much uh, engagement has there been outside of the kind of traditional Red Hat distributions? Have we seen contributions from users on Ubuntu, from Debian, and from other flavors of Linux? You know, how wide has this gone so far? This is, as far as I'm aware, the first time that anyone has told anyone outside Red Hat what Insights is as a com at a community level. Um, I'd love, I'd really want to see. Uh, people run this on Debian, on Ubuntu, on Arch, on Gentoo, on FreeBSD. So pull what requests it, welcomed. Absolutely. Um, the and I and I, I I don't want to discourage people with that. Um, yeah, basic uh, the basically the where we're at is we've. We have been, uh, you know, Insights Core has been developed for a number of years and there's a lot of work that's gone into that. Um, that is continually improving. There's, you know, both parser improvements and improvements to the core functionality. Um, the, the community side of that, um, that's where I feel that, or that, that's where I'd like to see a, a a much stronger sort of engagement and you know I really want to see how that works. I know there's going to be problems so let's go out and fix them. Yes. As a follow on to that, um, the name Insights Core and the demo rules allude me to the fact that there's probably a productized closed set of rules for this. Uh, it seems like that might interfere a little bit with trying to develop a community set. Uh, is that the case or am I, am I wrong or? Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to emphasize that the slide's are green and I wear a red hat here. Um, I really don't care if the community itself comes up with an exact duplicate of the stuff that we've written internally, because what that means is we're writing this, the same useful things, right? Um, 
But I also think that uh, insights is much better served by small communities of rules in the same way that something like Nagios Exchange um, has individual plugins shared and you can pull them down and keep them up to date um, and you see what people are using and then you can contribute to them. Um, but you're not, and that's, that's a central repository, but rules can be hosted anywhere. They're basically a directory structure that can be easily converted to Git. And it's actually a really good point. One of the things that I hadn't um, said that I should have is, there's no reason why you can't, or they, you can list multiple rule repositories and you can install multiple rule repositories in that virtual environment and then use multiple or all of them simultaneously. Um, so you could have one that's specific to the database you use, you could have one that's specific to the distro that you use, and you could have one that's specific to your own particular taste, and then you have your own one that's, you know, your private rules that you like. Go and knock yourself out. <laughs> cool. uh, secondary question would be, is there any integration with SOS report for perhaps analysing the result of an SOS report rather than the machine directly, or conversely, I guess, perhaps an SOS prop plug in to pull insights data? Yes. Um, this was, and you'll see the evidence there in the, the history and in the current incarnation, this is based on SOS report, or it was based initially on reading SOS reports, and uh, the JSON that's captured is an attempt to move, to move beyond slurping up a gigantic tarball of stuff from the user's system, uploading it to a Red Hat machine and then processing it. And that's why, I guess that's why I'm interested more in, in the, the idea that the rules are executed on this machine. It makes it really fast to test things. It also makes it much easier to, like it, it's a much, we don't want a distributed system here. You don't need a distributed system. You run the, the rules on the machine and away you go. How are we going in the time? Are there any last and questions? Two minutes, a few more questions. Was there one, one over there or no? That's okay. All good, thank you very much.